Well, good morning. It is good to be here. Um, are you guys afraid of me? <laughs> you guys would fit in really well with our house of prayer because we always really like sitting in the back. But like, this is kind of, this might be weird, but are you guys willing just to come forward a few rows? Why don't we just come forward a few rows? This like kind of feels like we're all kind of sitting back row. Yeah, thanks guys. You can all come like three rows, three rows further forward over on this side at least. That's, uh, I know we get comfortable in our church rows and it's probably a hassle if you have kids too. I apologize, but only a little bit. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I can't, I can't spit that far when I get excited and talk, so you're, you're safe. You're really, really safe. Um, yeah, I, first of all, I just want to thank the worship team. I was just a mess in tears during worship, and uh, I, I just want to be really, really honest. I just simply don't care about preaching good sermons. Um, I remember when I was learning how to preach, and I mean, when I would prepare messages here, I would write everything out word for word, and then I would have like a nine-page like manuscript, basically, and then I would cut it down by a couple of pages and weighing every single word, and it was just like I wanted to be so careful in, in how I spoke, but like over the last decade, the Lord has just been like, I mean, I still want to preach nice messages, but like I'm just, I want the Lord. And I want to be obedient to say what I feel like he's, he's putting on my heart. And I think often in church, we're way too polished. You know, we come in and we do our church thing and we sing our church songs and we stand in our church rows. And one of the things the Lord's been speaking about me as I was preparing for this morning is that You have to choose between respectability and revival. And you can't have both. You can't have both. In fact, I can, I can almost guarantee this, that if revival came to this church, some of you would leave. Not because I'm like thinking of anyone in particular, but that's, what always, that's always what happens when revival comes. It's always what happens when revival comes. There are some people who are so used to doing things a certain way and they're like, this doesn't fit our mold anymore and they're off and gone. It, every single revival that's ever hit, you just hear stories of people who get offended in the midst of it. And I just, like the, the Lord doesn't let us keep our respectability in the midst of revival because in revival, he's the only one who gets glorified and it means that we sometimes have to get real and we get messy and he speaks to us in ways that don't make any sense at all, but we know that it's him and we have to be obedient to him. You can't do prim and proper church when the presence of God comes. And I think he wants to encourage us in part just to like loosen up what I call a, growing up, I used to call them the Mennonite shackles where it's like I couldn't even, I couldn't lift my hands in church. That's not how we did it in my church growing up. It's the Mennonite shackles. It's like, <laughs> I want to raise my hands, but they're kind of stuck down there. But it's, it's a symbol of what goes on in our heart that we, we keep things sometimes so close to the chest. And I think the Lord wants us increasingly just to be real because he's real. He's alive. And when he comes into a service, when he comes into a meeting, he changes everything when he comes with his manifest presence. I mean, he's, he's at every service because he's omnipresent as God. He's, he's everywhere, but his tangible presence is not everywhere. In fact, his tangible presence isn't welcome in many churches because he will disrupt the schedule. He'll disrupt the way that, he's, the way that we do things. I think the Lord is increasingly inviting us to be a people who, who learn how to go with the flow. And sometimes we're more afraid about offending people than we are offending God. <laughs> and sometimes we just need to drop our concern about what people think and just go after what the Lord is saying. So, um, so like I said, it's not my goal to preach a good message this morning. 
But I, I know that the Lord has something for us. And I know that the Lord has something for you this morning. Um, I felt it so strongly during worship. So, um, uh, I guess for about a month now, I've been on staff. Like, I'm still on staff with Sanctuary House of Prayer in Winnipeg. I've been on staff there for a couple of years. Raise all of my own support. So if any one of you are looking for someone to support, <laughs> throwing that out there. But, uh, but I also am involved now with another ministry called uh, Street Invaders. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about it because it really plays into what I want to speak about today. So guys, I don't know, did you get, find that video? If you guys could give that a play. This is last year's video for the ministry, so the dates are outdated, but the heart isn't. There should be sound with this as well. Yeah. I was really bad. I just told them about this at like 10.30, right on the dot. So, thanks guys. Street Invaders is the opportunity for you to come and encounter God in a personal way and forever be changed by His love. As we focus outwardly and as we learn to, to talk to people and as we learn to bring our faith into our day-to-day -day lives, we change inwardly. These classes are going to help you decide not only what you believe, but everything that you learn is applicable to every day of your life. Street Invaders really helped develop me in how to tell the gospel to people, how to, how to see people as loved by the Lord. It creates this culture within people and friends as they leave that they want to encourage each other and really build off each other. To see the youth excited about God, it's got it's to catch onto the rest of the church. It's just amazing. Every year we see kids come from a variety of different backgrounds and they just all leave the same. They leave feeling empowered, they feel bold, they feel like they have purpose, they feel hope. Student Invaders has really taught me confidence. I feel like I've matured. My faith has grown. It definitely took me out of my comfort zone. What I thought of Christianity before is something completely different to me now. Through Street Invaders, I really got to put my faith to the test and really uh, impact other people's lives. It's okay to step out. It's okay to take a risk. That's what the Bible tells us to do, is to step out and to share our faith. And if your heart is willing, God will change you forever. I'd really encourage you to get involved because I know that if you're willing to come and you're willing to put your heart into it, your life will be changed. And whatever you're searching for, whatever you're looking for, Jesus is faithful and He'll show up and He'll meet you there. So the, the Lord kind of hijacked me because He's, he, it's crazy. Um, to getting involved with this ministry. So this last summer, I, I mentioned when I was out here last that I was just out there for a week and they asked me, like, I'm just getting to know the main director, but the Lord had been speaking to their team and I knew a few people on the team to get involved with starting this uh, boot camp in Winnipeg. So we're going to launch next summer out of Winnipeg and um, basically help disciple a generation in sharing their faith and praying for the sick and bringing the kingdom of God wherever they go. And during that week I was out there, and I mentioned it in my last message, I, uh, we, we saw 20 people get healed on, on one evening. And it was wild as the power of God was being released. And not everyone who prayed for got healed. There were people that I prayed for. There's a guy I prayed for who didn't get healed. But, but there are pe other people who did get healed. And the, the Lord was just really moving in a powerful sort of way. And so continuing the story now over the last couple of months, um, I had a dream near the beginning of September, and in the dream I was lying in bed, 
And I was, you know, like in that, in the dream, I was like half awake trying to get up and I was trying to put on this t-shirt and it was a Street Invaders t-shirt. And, uh, and then there's a, a couple other components to the dream as well. But, but I woke up and I was trying to figure out like what on earth is going on. And so as I was praying about it and asking the Lord about it, because the Lord will often speak to us and he does speak to us in dreams, but you know, it's, it's not always clear. He'll talk in parables and riddles. You have to ask him about it and search it out. But I remembered the passage in Luke where it talks about when the Holy Spirit comes, we'll be clothed in power from on high. And, I, and the Lord was wanting to clothe me in this Street Invaders t-shirt, and I knew that it represented healing. I knew it represented evangelism. Both things that like, I don't feel like I'm all that good in. But he somehow like, got me into the midst of, of what's going on with Street Invaders. And it was actually funny, there was, a, there was a second scene to the dream, and then I heard like this, this uh, military like voice saying, retreat, retreat, retreat. And I was just like, so I wake up, I'm like, am I supposed to retreat from Street Invaders? Like, am I not supposed to get involved in there at all? Like, what, what is this dream about? And, and as I was praying about it over the next couple of days, all of a sudden a light bulb went on that I was speaking at a youth retreat the next week. And at that youth retreat, <laughs> retreat, retreat. <laughs> Uh, we were supposed to pray for healing, which is just outside of my comfort zone. Um, I, I believe in praying for healing. It's just that I haven't seen a lot of people overall in my life get healed when I pray for them. And so, uh, but I just felt like it was clear. And this is a grade seven and eight retreat that I was uh, speaking at. And so, so I'm just like, well, I, I just got to do it. It's like, if I look like a fool, then I look like a fool. I, I got to be obedient. Like, I felt like it was clearly from the Lord. And so, so, so we have this group of grade seven and eights, and I explain, hey, we want to pray for the sick. And so I wanted one person to volunteer, kind of that we could pray for them first, so I could teach the, these kids how to, how to pray for the sick. And um, because I didn't want to pray for any of them, I wanted them to do the praying. And so one guy volunteers, so his ankle had been really, really sore. And so he comes up, and I get two or three of, the, of these uh, youth to pray for him, asking the Lord to heal his ankle. And I'm like, oh, Lord. <laughs> Oh, Lord, if you don't do something, I don't know what's going on here. I don't have, like, my faith for this was so small. I just knew I was supposed to be obedient. And so, uh, and so they pray for the guy, and nothing happens. And, uh, and, and I know that when you're praying for the sick, I've learned this much, that, that you, you want to pray at least a couple of times. So they just pray, Lord, I just ask in Jesus' name that you would heal him. Would you release healing to his ankle? Amen. So they just prayed their prayer because there's no magic formula um, there's that, that you you pray when you pray for someone and uh like oh oh. (laughs) it's like well let's let's try it again i'm like lord i really hope something happens a second time is what i'm thinking on the inside trying to look calm on the outside because i'm the leader guy right like this is really going to put a damper on my message if if nothing happens here and i think the lord up in heaven is like i really am not that interested in your message looking cool anyway but uh so they pray from the second time and said oh does it feel any better and his first response was No, it feels the same. I'm like, oh no. (laughs) I don't know where this is going now. Now we're supposed to pray for the sick and nothing's happened. But he he keeps on going. He says, but but I feel a tingling in my ankle. Something just feels a little bit different. I'm like, (laughs) grasp. I'm not just grasping at straws. I know enough that that if someone starts feeling some tingling there, that it's it's a sign off and that the Lord is beginning to do something. Where we sometimes want the Lord to work in 10 seconds. (laughs) And he's just like, no, I. I can stretch this out over a few minutes. Like I, it's like Jesus prayed for one guy who, and, and his, uh, his eyesight started to come back, but it was still blurry, and then he prayed for him again, and then he could see clearly. And so that's, the Lord can heal however he wants to heal. So, so we pray for a guy the third time, and, um, and after the third time, his ankle actually started to get better. It was like half the pain was gone. He was feeling way better. I said, oh, can we pray for you again? He's like, no, I'm good. And I'm like, yeah, I don't blame you. You've been the guinea pig. <laughs> he actually came the next day and told me, he said like, if the pain was a 10 yesterday, it's a 1 today. And, uh, and so the Lord actually did release um, healing in his ankle. And another girl ended up getting healed that, that day as well. And so it was like, oh, that's really, really cool. Um, but you kind of want to leave it there a little bit. And then I was speaking um, on Thanksgiving in, uh, in Low Farm at a church. And I felt like the Lord was saying, you, you need to do this again. And, uh, you know, they're going through their, their prayer requests before I'm praying for them. And, uh, and it just seems like half their church is sick. And, I mean, there's, there's a guy there that I, that I know and, uh, who, has, who has cancer. There's various other injuries, stuff like this going on in the church. 
and, uh, and you know, and they're, they're kind of doing their prayer for their sick, and, um, you know, in Certainly for people who come out of a Mennonite background, we tend to have a really good theology of suffering, but almost no theology of healing. <laughs> and so their prayer for healing was basically, Lord, just be with them in their suffering and help them. And the Lord wants to be with us in our suffering. So like, there's nothing wrong with praying that, but there was no faith at all that the Lord might possibly want to heal anyone. And I'm like, I don't know how I'm supposed to pray for healing here because I don't know if anyone even really believes the Lord would do anything. Um, just thinking in my heart, but I actually know their hearts, and I know that they're better than that. But in the moment, I'm just like, I'm just like, I'm having some of these doubts, right? But anyway, I'm like, well, I think we're supposed to do it. So I asked, is there anyone here in the church who's sick and, uh, and, and would like prayer for, for healing right now? And so there's four different people who stood up. And, uh, and so I just encourage the congregation to get around them and pray for them. And uh, again, like no magic formula. If you, you know, ask the Lord to heal whatever is wrong with them and and let them do it. And sometimes we say, Lord, if it's your will this, if it's your will that, and, and it's just kind of like, no, like just ask the Lord to heal them, and what he does is up to him. You don't, you don't need to give the Lord excuses. It's funny because when the Lord first started telling me to like do this in a service, my first thought was, isn't it presumptuous? This is, this is presumptuous. I'm going to come up here, who do I think I am, presuming that God is going to heal some people when I'm, when I'm leading something like has he told me clearly? That's so presumptuous. And I, so I'm thinking this thought and I feel the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart like that and he's saying, Brian, you're presumptuous all the time. You presume I'm not going to heal anybody. You presume I'm not a healer. You presume that people don't want to hear the gospel and so that's why you don't want to share it. You presume that, that I'm not powerful enough. You presume that I as God am not strong enough to save a lost person. You presume there's no power on the preaching of the gospel so that's why you're afraid to preach the gospel. And he's like, <laughs> just like, man, you nailed me. <laughs> so, you know, like, what is presumption, right? <laughs> How often do we, we think that people who pray for you, oh, you're so presumptuous, and yet we have our own presumptions about God as well. So the Lord nailed me there, so I had no more excuses. So these people were praying for each other, and I, I'll just be honest, like, you know, there's a parable of the mustard seed. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, I was probably at mustard seed or smaller. <laughs> They're praying for each other, and I know what I'm supposed to do at that point as someone who's leading it. I'm supposed to ask, did anyone notice any improvement? And I don't want to do it. Because I'm like, no, this is just going to look silly. It's going to be a downer for everyone. Everyone's going to be disappointed. I might as well just, you know, okay, we did this. Now we'll get to our service, and if they get healed, they get healed. But I was like, no, I, I can't let myself off the hook that way. And so I just asked, did anyone get healed? And this lady puts her hand up, and she has tears coming down her face. And she's had ongoing shoulder issues and pain in her shoulder, and it's completely healed. And she came up to me after the service, and she's like, so this is like about 40, 50 minutes later, and she says, she says, I can't believe it. Like, I keep moving it. I keep expecting the pain to come back. It's not coming back. The pain's not coming back. My shoulder is completely healed. And, and I, I don't understand why God heals some people, and he doesn't heal others. I don't understand that. But we understand, like we, we've prayed for people, right? We've all prayed for some people, and, and they haven't gotten healed. But the only way you're ever going to see someone healed by your prayers is if you actually pray for people who are sick. Right? It's like the only way you're ever going to lead someone to Christ is if you actually tell somebody about Christ. You have to step out in obedience and take those risks. You have to step out in obedience and take those risks. And the cool thing about praying for sick people is that the worst thing that can possibly happen when you're praying for a sick person is that they leave in the exact same condition as when you started. <laughs> That's the worst that can happen. There's really not a lot of risk to praying that God would heal a sick person. There just isn't, because again, the worst thing that can happen to them is, okay, well, I came in with a really bad back. It's been bad for a while. You prayed for me. Now it's still bad. Okay, well, I didn't really lose anything out of that. But the best thing that can happen is that the Lord breaks in in power and they're healed completely. It doesn't always feel respectable to take those sorts of risks. It kind of takes us out of our comfort zone, but you don't really get to choose. 
You know, I want respectability and revival. I want the Holy Spirit to move, but I want to keep my cool reputation and stay really safe and have a faith that never challenges me at all. We, that, that, that's just not what we signed up for when we signed up to follow Jesus. So we're going to take a risk this morning. Who here in this church has some physical condition that you would like to see God heal you of this morning? Is there anyone here who has some sort of physical condition? If, if, yeah, there's... How many people? Just raise a hand. Okay. Remember, again, the worst that can happen to you is that you stay in the same condition that you came in in. So there's not really a lot of risk involved here on your part. So here's what we want to do is if you're comfortable, what we want to do is just take like... Maybe five minutes to pray for you. If even that. You just saw two miracles in your church on a Sunday morning. See, in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit was moving in power, it said that people who are, who are kind of against the church, they were really hesitant about meeting with them, about even coming, and yet people were being brought in all the time. But there was a holiness and a sense of awe when you walked into one of their gatherings because you knew that the power of God was there. What would it look like if this church had the reputation of <laughs> if you're really seeking an encounter with God, you should go there, but if you're just playing games, that's not the right church for you. What would it look like if this was a place where God wanted to come in a consistent basis and encounter people? Guys, I am like a toddler in this stuff. I feel like in this season, the Lord is taking me back into kindergarten in the spirit. But I know what Jesus said in the Bible. In John 14, 12, that anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing and he will do even greater things than these so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. And it's not about us and it's not about how cool you are. It's not about how righteous you are. It's about the Father wanting to put his Son on display and make a spectacle of Jesus, not of us, not of our church. We don't want to bring any attention to ourselves, but we want all the glory to go to him. And I believe in this season in our nation, the Lord is wanting to make a spectacle of Jesus. He's wanting to put him on display. The church right now in so many parts of our nation is just a byword and it's a butt of jokes. But it's not staying that way. Because the Lord is starting to release a hunger in his people. He's starting to release a hunger in his people who say, hey, we've, we've read the book of Acts, we've read what the Bible says, and we're not going to be content with anything less than the fullness of what God has for us as his children. We don't want to just show up at church and play games. We want the power of God. We want the presence of God in our midst. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. I have the feeling we're going to go late this morning. If you need to leave for any reason, like, just feel free. I'm going to do my best to not go too long. Um, but I think the Lord has something for us, and I, don't, I also don't want to miss it by just cutting it short at 12 o'clock. Matthew 9, starting in verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And then it goes on. I'll, I might as well read the, the rest of it that I want to read as well. In verse, uh, verse 7, he sends out his disciples and he says, As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. I want to suggest that for much of the last 2,000 years, the church has only been doing a part of what Jesus told us to do. We've been only doing a part of what he actually asked us to do and said is possible for us as believers. 
and we lock the Holy Spirit up in a small little back corner of our church because we're uncomfortable with his gifts, we're uncomfortable with his power, and we really want to be respectable. And maybe we've seen people talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, and maybe they haven't always done it with wisdom, and maybe they haven't always done it with maturity, and so then we're like, well, that's, that's not good, and so we're, like, we're just going to lock Holy Spirit up over here in the corner because he makes us uncomfortable, and those gifts just aren't for today anymore. We just saw two people get healed this morning. Either they're lying, or maybe God's bigger than what we think. Either they're lying, or maybe Jesus was serious when he said, anyone who comes after me, anyone who has faith in me, will do what I've been doing. Maybe he meant what he said. I believe, I want to, like, I just want to say this from the depth of my heart. It's time for the church to stop playing games with God and decide, are we all in or are we not? Do we want the fullness of his presence? Do we want the fullness of his power? Or are we going to like just step back from it because we're afraid we're going to offend a couple of people? And I would just far rather, and I, I don't like offending people at all. I'm, I'm a people-pleasing kind. I grew up Mennonite. We just want everyone to be happy. But I would just far rather, far rather have people upset at me than I would back off one inch about what the Bible says is, is possible for us. When Jesus said the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few, therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers, I think if we want to actually describe and figure out what he meant by that phrase, workers, you have to look at what he was doing in the passage. You have to read the passage in context. And it said that Jesus was going from town to town in villages and he was, he was healing. He was preaching the good news of the kingdom. So he was preaching the good news and he was healing every disease and sickness. And that's what he was doing. He was preaching the good news and he was healing every disease and sickness. And we love to focus on the Sermon on the Mount and we should focus on the Sermon on the Mount. But he was also healing people almost everywhere that he went. People were getting healed. The kingdom of God was going forth in power and people were getting healed. Jesus has compassion, and he says, Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. He's he's asking for workers that look like him. If you turn back in your Bible into, you know, Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is baptized with the Holy Spirit and power, and then in Matthew 5 through 7, he gives a sermon on the mount. It's the constitution of the kingdom. It's the, the righteous way that we're supposed to live, which is so important. So many people have chased after the power of the Holy Spirit and left character far behind. And that's not biblical in any stretch of the imagination. We don't just want the power of the Spirit, we want the fruit of the Spirit. But then in Matthew 8, Jesus is healing a man with leprosy. And and further on in Matthew 8, he's healing this centurion servant. And then in Matthew 8, verses 14 and following, Jesus heals many different people. He's just healing a whole bunch of people who are brought to him. And then he heals, he calms a storm. Then he heals two demon-possessed men. Then he heals a paralytic. He's just bringing, he heals a dead girl, sick woman. Heals a blind and the mute. And then he says, we need more workers. And he means more workers who look like me. I think that's why he said, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. Most of the time I've heard this passage preached. I've heard it preached as the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Therefore, you need to go out in the harvest right now. That's how I've heard it preached. But that's not what the verse says. The verse does not say the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Therefore, go out and preach. We have the great commission for that. So we we have a verse for that. We, we, We don't need two verses for it. We have a really good one that we're supposed to go out and preach. But in this passage, Jesus says, Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. These kind of workers only get birthed in prayer. These kind of workers, I want to go even a step further and say, only get birthed in a place of prayer and fasting and asking the Lord to pour out his spirit just like he did throughout scripture. They only get birthed by a community that says, I see this in scripture. I want the fullness of what God has for me. Whatever it looks like, I'm going after it. It only get birthed in prayer. And that's why when Jesus, then in chapter 10, he demonstrates what happens when the Father sends him out and he gives him authority over disease, authority over sickness to walk in the power of God. 
and to preach the gospel as they went. And we've, we've tried to do one part of it, preaching the gospel, but we've done it without the demonstration of power, which was just thoroughly a biblical model. Paul talks about when he, he came to preach, I think it's in, in Corinthians, where he says, I didn't come with words of human wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. With a demonstration of the Spirit's power. That when he preached the word, heaven backed him up with signs, wonders, and miracles, and people turned to God. Or they stoned him. He couldn't remain neutral, though. That's what New Testament Christianity looked like. That's what's available to us. I believe it's what the Lord is doing and starting to raise up in our nation right now. The stories of some of my friends, the Lord, like I said, I'm in kindergarten in this. So, like, I don't know, maybe you're in kindergarten too. Maybe you feel like you're in preschool. I'm in kindergarten. I'm a, I'm a baby in this. I'm learning a little bit. I'm, I'm seeing the Lord start to move in ways it's like, I, he's doing it. This is who he is. But I have friends who are in grade two or three. <laughs> my grade two and three sto- friends tell me stories of going out and praying for people on the streets and getting healed. And then the people are ready to receive the gospel. There's a ministry right now in the city, in Winnipeg. It's called Kingdom H2O. They they minister out of Zion Apostolic Church. I have a number of good friends who are involved in that ministry. And they have seen, they quit counting at 300 eyes that got healed. They minister at Portage Place. They minister in Central Park, some of the areas where there's a lot of addicts and brokenness. There's people who have diabetes, cataracts on their eyes as a result of it, other issues like that. They have videos of it, of people. I just saw one the other day of a lady who is just, she's just, like, she's crying. She's crying because now her, she couldn't see out of that eye before, and now she can see out of that eye. And then they preach Jesus to her. I mean, it's, you know, it's one thing when you see a video and you're like, well, is this a sham? Is it fake? She's just crying. She's just in awe. She's like, what is going on? Holy cow. <laughs> There's a one video of a guy who got healed who wasn't a believer yet. And he's, he's like, there's words coming out of his mouth that aren't that good, but it's all he knows how to say. He just got healed. Like, what on earth happened to me? So, I want to tell you a few stories of what I feel like the Lord's been speaking to me over the last three or four years. We have this guy named Taylor Stutz. He's a, he's a missionary with YWAM. And right now he's involved with a ministry called Circuit Riders. He, uh, he comes by Winnipeg once a year for a few months because his wife's family is from nearby. And we somehow met him in our house of prayer, so we get him to come and speak every year. Just like, hey, you're a YWAM guy. You hear these cool stories from all over the world. We don't get out much. Come tell us some stories about what God is doing. We just need to be encouraged. And so he comes and tells us. And so about four or five years ago, he was doing that. Then he comes every year. And, uh, you know, he's talking about just amazing things God's doing in Nepal. He's talking about cool things God's doing in some other places, how the gospel is going forth and they're, how they're strategizing to reach people with the good news. And then he starts talking about this ministry that they just started up um, called the Circuit Riders. I'll tell you a little bit about the history of it. The Great Awakening in the early 1700s, the Lord came in power, in power, and really shifted the trajectory of the U.S., really shifted the trajectory of America. The power was felt in the U.K. as well as the Lord poured out his spirit and many, many thousands and thousands and thousands of people turned to God. One of the key figures used in that was John Wesley. John Wesley went off, you know, came to America from the U.K., went back and, uh, and asked for some guys to come with him. And one of the guys who came with him was named Francis Asbury who has kind of became known as the preeminent circuit rider in the U.S. It's estimated that he, he rode 250,000 miles on horseback. 250,000 miles on horseback over the course of his life, and he raised up a whole generation of, of young believers who would just carry the gospel to them wherever they went, all across. And it was the wild, wild west back then. I mean, these guys, a lot of them, they, they knew the gospel message. They had been saved, and they knew the gospel message, but they were illiterate. 
but they still brought a Bible with them just as like defense so that if they went on someone's yard, it was like often a shoot first, ask questions later. They at least had some proof that they were believers and they would have this certificate saying that they could preach the gospel because otherwise someone would think, you're coming to steal my stuff and, and they would be killed. Many of these guys actually died before they hit 30 years old. But they're given credit for in many ways helping to disciple the nations because they went to all these small communities where there was almost no witness of the gospel and they were preaching the reality of who God was. So about eight or nine years ago, the Lord started speaking to a group of YWAMers and he said, I, I want to release circuit riders again who are going to carry the gospel out just across America. And, and I believe it's, it's a word bigger than America, but they're American, so they heard for America. So they, they've started to mobilize this ministry that right now is primarily visiting college and university campuses in the U.S., but it's spreading into some other nations as well. Last year, they sent out 200 young adults. They saw 2,000 salvations um, on 200 different campuses that they were ministering on. But the Lord was moving in their midst. Anyway, he's, he's just telling us about this ministry starting, and as he's telling us, I just start weeping. Like all the other cool stuff God was doing, oh, that's cool, that's cool. But for some reason, as he's talking about this, I am weeping. Like not, you know, during worship today, I'm like feeling the Lord's presence, and I'm feeling my emotions stirred up, I'm crying, I got some little tears. This was different though. This was like, like bawling my eyes out, like does someone have a towel? A Kleenex won't do. It was just, and I'm, so I'm sitting there, he's talking about this, and I'm, I'm in, in my mind, like I'm, I'm feeling it, but I'm also thinking like, what is going on right now? What is going on right now? This has only happened to me, I think, three times that I can think of in my life during a message where I've, where I've felt the presence of the Lord in that way. And I, I know it's the presence of the Lord. He was, he was highlighting this ministry to me in a really, really profound way that he is looking to raise up messengers who are going to carry the gospel across our nation. And he needs messengers who are going to carry it across our nation, but he also needs them who are going to call, carry the gospel across the field. And across the, the table at the coffee shop. He needs all of them, but he's, he's, he was talking to me about this circuit rider thing, and I knew that he was highlighting something for me in the midst of this calling. And then I was in our prayer room. Um, I'm fast forwarding for the sake of time. And, and a couple of years ago, it was in November. I think it was in November anyway. I have, it, I have the date on my phone, but I was just spending some time with the Lord, and, and I. And sometimes I just feel like the Lord's talking to me, and so I just start to write it down. And sometimes I, you know, I read it later, and I'm like, well, I don't really know if that was the Lord or not. I, I weigh it, you know. But this time, as, as I'm writing stuff down, I hear this, this phrase in my heart, and, and when it hit me, it hit me with this, this wave of emotion that I've come to recognize is, is a Holy Spirit. And the phrase he spoke to me was that Canada is like winter wheat. Was that Canada is like winter wheat. And I started processing it with the Lord and started asking the Lord about it. And, and you know, I, it's, you're always in trouble when you're giving a farm analogy to a bunch of farmers. Because <laughs> there's always a chance you're going to mess it up a little bit. But I've researched this a little bit, you know. And I knew a little bit too, you know. You just want to make sure you, I don't sound completely dumb, right? Like, I had an office that I could see a field from when I worked here. But, but those, most of you know that winter wheat is a crop that you plant in the fall. And... It starts to germinate, but it lies dormant all winter. But if you didn't know anything about farming, you would think that the farmer who planted winter wheat was just the dumbest guy in the world. Like, what are you doing? You're putting all the seed in the ground. It's, it's a complete waste. And then, you know, when the farmer would tell you, no, I, I know what I'm doing. And then you would come back, and it would be like in, in January or December when it's minus 30 outside, and the wind is howling, and there's a foot of snow on the field. And then you're thinking, okay, this guy is really, really crazy. Look at this. All that seed was completely wasted. It was completely wasted. There was no effect. All that effort, all that work, all that money for absolutely nothing. Until the springtime comes. And then winter wheat is, it pops up from the ground and it starts to grow. And I felt like the Lord was speaking over our nation. That's why I entitled my, my, my message, Hope for Canada. Is that, I felt like the Lord was saying, Canada is like winter wheat. And for decades, 
There's been, a, there's been a sowing into our nation. Churches that have sowed the gospel message again and again and again. Faithful believers who've been faithfully trying to share their faith with their friends again and again and again. And often it feels like no one's listening and nothing is ever happening. But I, I felt the Holy Spirit speaking to me and saying, no, there is a springtime coming. There is a springtime coming. And, and I believe in the midst of it that what he was speaking to me about that is on his heart to raise up messengers who are going to carry the gospel again across our nation. Which, you know, like, you, can, you know, it's kind of, well, okay, that's kind of cool. That, that's like, okay, that's, that's really subjective, Brian. That's really a lot of your own feelings. That's a, really a lot of your own emotions. The problem is, is that I keep running into these messengers. I keep meeting them and I had no idea that they existed. So I run into like and, and connect with this street invader ministry. I had no idea what the Lord was doing there. No idea of people who do three or four years of that program. And then they hit 19, 20, 21, some of them 24, 25, 26, 27. And they have consistent testimonies of people getting saved and set free on the streets as they share the gospel of Jesus. I ran into this discipleship um, at arm of this school at, at Eston College where they, it's a basically a street evangelism program and they, they send their students out across the streets just to share the gospel with people. And they see people get healed all the time and they see people get saved all the time. But it's all just the beginning of the beginning of the beginning. It's all just the beginning of the beginning of the beginning. There is a harvest coming in our nation. God's not going to let the devil just have the last laugh. And we know that the Bible is clear that in the last days, there's going to be shaking and there's going to be a falling away and there's going to be trouble. But the Bible is also clear in Acts 2 that in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And there is an outpouring of his spirit that is already in the early days in our nation. And he's raising up a fearless generation who's not going to be afraid to share their faith. He's raising up a generation who's going to walk in boldness and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the question I feel like he's asking of many churches in a season is this, is do you want to be a part of this or not? Do you want to be a part of this or not? We can only sit on the fence for so long and eventually we're no longer sitting on the fence. We're saying no to the power of God. We can only say, sit on that fence or stand on the edge of the bank of the river of God. You know, in Ezekiel 47, there's that river that, that starts ankle deep and then gets deeper and deeper and deeper. But you can, you can only stand on the bank of that river for so long and then you're not even interested about jumping in and you're just a casual observer and saying like, I don't know. I'm going to criticize this river as well. You know, that's what I'm going to do. I think I'm just going to sit back here and I think the Lord's appointed me to, to criticize this river and how it's flowing. And the Lord's saying, jump in. Jump in. Jump in. We need to ask ourselves in this season, and I, I believe that this transition period that you guys have in between pastors is an opportunity for you to ask yourselves, what do we want? Are we all in? Do we want to start taking some risks? Do we want to start going after some of this stuff? Where are we going to line up? Where are we going to line up in this move of the Spirit? Because there is a move of the Spirit that happened in the 90s and that was, that was hitting here in Manitoba in certain areas. And yeah, in certain places, they didn't deal with it all that well because there's always going to be flesh in the midst of the move of the Spirit because wherever human beings are, there's flesh. And there's going to be people who learn a few things about the power of the Holy Spirit and they get so excited, they try to tell everyone, and then they, but they do a horrible job about it. And maybe they get prideful about it or whatever. And then it's like, and we're just like, okay, I don't want any of that sort of stuff. And then we just like back away. And it's just like, no, we just need to realize and have grace that like people get excited. Sometimes people are immature in their understanding about things. Sometimes people don't explain it the way that they should. Like, it's okay. I'm immature too. I've said things in ways that I wish I could take back. I've said things that are like, in, 
I just had this experience at work where I just, you know, I was trying to share from my heart, but there were some ugly things in my heart. So I had to like, I had to repent to my whole, our whole staff. I like called them all up. Like, I'm so sorry. That was so stupid what I just said. Like, please forgive me. I say stupid things too. (laughs) So I was like, but that doesn't mean I throw out the power of God, you know, just because I say stupid things. It's like, no. Like, we want to have grace for people who maybe don't quite know how to share it in the right way, but we still want to go after God with all that we have. And it doesn't leave, you know, mean leaving our brain behind us. But it does mean you're going to see some things that you have absolutely no grid for and you're not quite sure where to put it in your brain. (laughs) And it's going to mean maybe it doesn't quite fit your brain. It just is. Either God's bigger than our brains or he's not. So, There's a few things that I want to encourage you with this morning. And then I have, I have a little bit more to say because I just feel like there's, there's something more yet. The first is this, is whoever you are, we need to pray for our nation right now. We need to pray for our nation. Past revivals never happened when everything was going great in a the nation. They never happened when you had like just this like godly Christian prime minister and all the premiers were saved and all the laws that were passed were in complete righteousness. There is never any revival that happened in that sort of context. It always happened when it looked like this is a mess right now. It always happened when it looked like godlessness was winning. It always happened when it looked like the devil was just beating the Lord. It always happened in those sorts of settings that God poured out his spirit. And I think the Lord is setting our nation up for something. I've just been in too many, I've just spent too much time in prayer to believe otherwise. I spent too much time talking to the Lord about this and asking for revival to believe otherwise, that he's setting us up for something. So we need to pray for our nation. Secondly is we have to be open to the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to be open to his gifts. We have to be open to his gifts. Like, there is a New Testament gift of prophecy that's real. It's real, it's biblical, and it's not the same as Old Testament prophecy. It's not on par with Scripture. It always comes underneath Scripture. Always underneath Scripture. You never accept any prophetic word that varies even one degree, one percentage point from Scripture ever. But but there is a real gift. And many of you have seen it function, and some of you have functioned in it, that is actually, in the 1 Corinthians 14 model, actually encourages and builds up and edifies. It's just a real gift. It just is. And there's a real New Testament gift of tongues that has been one of the most powerful gifts in my own life in enabling me to maintain a fiery heart before God. It's just real. I've been in rooms with 1,500 people who are all speaking in tongues at the same time. It's, It's just real. It's just real. And we can't push those things aside. Nor can we just say, oh, well, I think they're okay, but they're just not for us. What we have to say is, I want everything God has for me, no matter what it looks like. And maybe it's not one of those gifts. Maybe it's something else. That's okay. But we have to have this mindset that says, God, I want everything that you have for me. It's like I said the last time I was here, Christianity is not boring. We've made it boring at times, but it's not boring. The kingdom of God's not boring. It's (laughs) <laughs> it's a little bit of an adrenaline rush <laughs> at times. A little bit fearful at times. Like I was talking to Kimberly beforehand, like, man, I just feel like there's stuff burning on my heart for this morning, but uh-oh, like, I don't know if I want to speak it here. Hmm. And finally, we have to ask him what our role is. God, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to take the gospel to? What, what's my role in this? Like there, there have to be people who fund what the Lord's going to do in the coming decades. And that's a really, really, really important role. It's a really, really, really important role. There have to be people who pray for it. And we all have a role in praying for it, but some of us are going to carry a, a specific, like even a, a more definite role of praying for this reality. And I think we all have a role in asking the Lord for more. 
I just, this, one of the prayers that I learned kind of in my early journey into discovering more about the power of the Holy Spirit is, God, I want everything you have for me no matter what it looks like. I don't want any flesh. I don't want any silliness. If it's not you, I'm not interested. But if it's you, I want it. If it's you, I want it. So here's my question for you this morning. Are you in? If you have to choose in your own life between respectability and revival, what, what do you want? What do you personally want? If you have to choose between respectability and revival, and you're like, well, I don't know if I want to go after those things because I know some people who have and everyone thinks they're weird, so it's like I don't want to be thought in that category too, but, but what if you don't have to be like them? What if you just have to go after what the Lord has for you? Respectability or revival? <laughs> Sometimes the goal is that we have no conflict and no difficulty, but there's also no conflict in a cemetery. Right? <laughs> there's no conflict in a cemetery either. It's like, well, <laughs> we're probably going to learn, we're probably going to make mistakes, but, but first we have to decide are we in or are we not? So why don't we all stand? Worship team, you can come up already. I want to give you a time to respond to the Lord. Just in your own heart. Respectability or revival? Do you want a really, really good reputation as like a really solid and decent person? Or do you want everything that the Lord has for you and for this church? No matter what it looks like. So just right now, let's just talk with the Lord about that. I I just want to give us a little bit of time for that. Maybe there's even been a time where you've like actually just kind of really made fun of some of the gifts of the Spirit. Maybe you've made fun of the activity of the Holy Spirit. And if you have, you need to repent of that. Like, just for real, you need to repent of that. Holy Spirit's God. You don't make fun of the things of the Father. You don't make fun of, fun of the things of the Son. Like, you don't make fun of the cross. Why would you make fun of the gifts of the Holy Spirit? He's just as much God, right, as the Father and as the Son is. And so you, you actually need to make that right with the Lord, if that's you. And then one last thing this morning. I, I just had this sense during worship. Um, we got Ezekiel 37 passage where I just feel like there's some of you who just feel like you're dry bones in this last season. And you feel like, man, I love the Lord, like, but... <laughs> I just feel so dry and I want more of him, but I feel so dry. And I, I, I know I love him, but I just feel so dry and I feel so distant. And I just felt like the Lord wanted to release that breath in Ezekiel 37 and breathe on some of our hearts. I believe he wants to shift some of our seasons. He wants to shift some of our seasons. I believe he wants to start breathing fresh vision, fresh joy, fresh hope into you again. He wants to start breathing fresh passion for Jesus into you again. And so I want to pray for that. And then we're going to... Um, Uh, worship with this last song. So Father, I ask for that Ezekiel 37, that breath of the Holy Spirit. Lord, would you blow on our hearts today? Lord, where we feel dry. Lord, where there's people who've just, we we love you, Lord, but we just felt so far away. We felt just so, so stale. Lord, we ask today that you would ignite fresh passion for you. We ask today, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit anew on us. Lord, we want everything that you have for us. So God, I ask even right now, would you come? Lord, would you come and fill us?